So I'm, I'm going to say things completely differently than, than everyone else has, uh, because I was asked to talk about government and policy. And everyone else here has been talking about health or science or applications. And the reason I wanted to talk about monopolies is that my goal is to make you understand that we have some choices that we have to make. And a lot of them have to do with monopolies. And in health, we have a lot of monopolies because they create economies of scale. And health is such a gigantic market and a gigantic problem that the economies of scale we get from things like Kaiser or Sutter or Epic bring a fair amount of benefit, especially when the system is deeply inefficient. And I was talking to a doctor who compared starting a practice in California right, to buying a Model T. As Henry Ford famously said, you can get it in any color as long as it's black. And if you're starting a practice in California, you basically have to join up with one of the monopolies that control large geographical regions, because they control the economies of scale and the access to the patients. And the problem is that reduces choice to the individuals. And so if you think about it in healthcare, it happens in other places. It happens in specimen work. So you can get, if I, if I go to ask my doctor for my blood work, I can get it from anyone as long as I want it from LabCorp. And so these monopolies are now present inside the system because the system is so inefficient that we have these monopolies help us with economies of scale. But monopolies have other impacts from a policy perspective that we need to think about. And so one of them is monopolies have a tendency to innovate in very incremental ways. Anyone who has complained about an iPhone 4 to iPhone 5 upgrade understands this, but we see it even more clearly in places like Windows. And you see it in healthcare. So this is my LabCorp data. Uh, this is actually from April. I have a new one that's slightly better because I've been exercising. Uh, you can see I have high cholesterol. I have particularly bad, um, uh, particularly high bad cholesterol. I also have some bad liver numbers, but those came from the fact that we had a fair amount of wine the night before the test. Those cleared up uh, in my most recent blood work. And so first of all, let's look at how non-computable this information is. This is basically the equivalent of a photograph of my data as opposed to actionable information. And it's because it's an incremental advance on my health record to scan it and send it to me. It's an episodic event. It's a piece of paper. We can just send it to me. And one way to think about incrementalism, because it's easy to get stuck in your own world and think about, well, the electronic health record's a breakthrough compared to this. It's not. Incrementalism is when you think my ear is a great information gathering technology. So I'm going to get a bigger ear. And I'm going to have more and more innovation in the way that I gather information about audio. And this was actually what they used to listen for German planes coming across the English Channel. And it's an easy thing to think of. Like, well, we're, we're already listening for them. We need gigantic ears to listen for them. They didn't. They needed radar. But the vendors of the giant ear horns were probably not really into the radar investments that were made by the British government. And I would argue that this electronic medical record is nothing more than a giant ear horn because it's listening for those moments that I go to the doctor's office, as opposed to helping build a longitudinal map of my health, of my genome, of my choices, of my environment. And that's one of the side effects of policies that encourage monopolies. Monopolies also bring us some network effects. This is a map of some of the protocols that underlie the internet. The internet, in its own way, is composed of a set of monopolies. They're open monopolies. They're not coercive monopolies. But you can have any internet you want as long as you use TCP IP. And what we've gotten is a spectacular set of network effects from this interacting set of open standard monopoly tools that let us build innovation at the edges of the network. This is the source of the monopoly, sorry, of the network effect in health, which is really depressing. I can't remember the last time outside of health someone asked me to fax them something or for a fax number. But because the vast majority of providers are still thinking about the medical record as a paper document, the fax machine is the primary source of the network effect in health. And so the policy choices we're making about the way that we do electronic health records and privacy in them are leading us towards using email as the fax machine for the electronic health record, as opposed to the sorts of data liquidity that we heard about earlier today, or the sorts of innovation that we take for granted as consumers. And 23andMe is a good example of one of these companies that I think is, is, is trying to achieve a network effect. And I'm a happy customer of 23andMe. This is my genotype. Tim showed his yesterday. I'll show you mine. 
Uh, as you can see, I have elevated risks of prostate cancer, psoriasis, Alzheimer's, and a disease I'm not going to try to pronounce. Now, getting this is great. Because 23andMe, uh, I have quibbles with them on a couple of things, but they let me download my data, and they let me illustrate another kind of effect of monopoly, which is when openness is the monopoly. When there's an absence of property at the core, when the public domain is the controlling aspect, some interesting things can happen. So I did an experiment. On October 1st, I uploaded my genotype to Synapse, which is the database that Stephen Friend talked about at SAGE, and if you went to the uh, session they ran yesterday. So this is, this is where it is now. I went through an informed consent process that I won't go into detail on, uh, where I understood that I was putting my genotype online. This is the raw file, the A's, T's, C's, and G's. It's now available inside a compute environment so people can use it to build models out of my genotype and out of my medical record. I've also uploaded my blood work and my electronic medical records so that you can start to tease out the correlations if there's enough people like me between the variations in my genome and the outcomes that you're seeing in my health. Because it was in a standardized and authenticated environment, I could syndicate it to a wiki called OpenSNP, which is run by a frustrated graduate student in Germany, who I believe is watching the live stream. And thank you, Bastian, for what you're doing. Now, by putting it at OpenSNP, it was able to be syndicated to another wiki called Snippedia, where it was automatically annotated by a set of algorithms. Now, it found very different things than 23andMe, and it didn't find everything that 23andMe found. But what it found most interesting, I like the fact that it says I won't go bald, uh, <laughs> but it was more interesting from a health perspective that it found a hypertension result that 23andMe hadn't found yet. Now, if I hadn't been allowed to download the file in a usable format and port it to a different place and syndicate it to multiple places, I never would have learned about this. And I have an uncle who suffers horribly from hypertension. And now he's getting sequenced, and we're going to see if he carries the same mutation. And we're going to actually see if we can use that as part of his clinical care. This would have never happened if control had been at the core of the network that's emerging around genotyping. And so during Ann's talk yesterday, I applied for developer credentials for the 23andMe API because I want to build an app that lets anyone that's been through a consent process export their data all, to all of these sites. And we'll see if my app is approved. Um, and the funniest thing I heard from this is from a genetic genealogist in the UK who sent me the, probably the best unsolicited email sentence I've gotten in my life, which is that there's no suggestion that my parents are inbred. <laughs> now, this could have gone badly. I'm from Tennessee, you know? <laughs> but seriously, the, the, I could have found out that I had some sort of lethal gene. I could have found out that my parents were inbred. Right? There are serious risks and potential bad outcomes to this. And they will be used as reasons why we should not allow people to take control of their data, that we shouldn't put people at the center of the system. Right? There's a paternalism in medicine and health, it's sort of a double. Like, you can't possibly understand this. And the only possible outcomes are bad, or the possible outcomes are so bad that we can't let anybody do it. And that's just not consistent with the reality of the openness that drives the monopolies that we depend on in our consumer lives. We're used to our data being liquid and moving around. And we're used to being able to do things with that information in a consumer context that help us. And there's a policy conflict coming. And so I've applied for developer credentials to do this for, my, for everyone's genotypes. I am also going to be applying for developer credentials to export all my survey answers from 23andMe because I also want to be able to donate my phenotype the exact same way that I just donated my genotype. And what's interesting is it's not just 23andMe that, that can participate in this. Because of openness as a monopoly, uh, there are startup companies that are doing things like aggregating all the underutilized service providers and core facilities at academic universities. So I can now bid out through a service uh, marketplace like Science Exchange. I can bid out all these things that used to be only available to clinical laboratories. I can bid them out from my samples or a pool of samples that I create for my friends and family. So instead of walking for cancer or buying yellow wristbands, I can go raise twenty, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars and generate clinically useful data and donate it to researchers. Now, the goal of this talk is not to convince you that open systems are better than closed systems, although I believe that. It's to convince you that there is a choice that you are making 
when you write code or start a company or do clinical research in the modern world. One of the choices is basically to choose the monopoly of the science industrial complex that Stephen Friend laid out yesterday, which is to say the answer to everything that we've been talking about is simply larger versions of the things that we're already doing. And this is what you hear often at the Institute of Medicine. I heard it there two weeks ago. We, need, we just need to make this one trial we're doing bigger. That's the answer. We need more money at an NIH. That is a plausible response, but it entrenches the monopoly of the academic system, and it entrenches the monopoly of government funding, and it does not entrench any of the ideas of openness. The second option is a small matrix of companies. So this would be a cartel, right, or, a, or an oligopoly, or whatever you want to say. And this is what we had in the late 80s before we had the web, but you couldn't send email from Prodigy to CompuServe or AOL. Just like right now, I can't send my data from patients like me to 23andMe and around. And that's the most logical outcome if we don't make a choice about openness, is that we're going to have a small matrix of companies because those companies are well-funded and they can provide delightful user experiences faster than open systems. Right? And if we don't think about the choice, this is the most likely choice that we wind up making. And the third choice is an open network. And it's in many ways the hardest choice. It's the longest term investment. Because it's a pain in the ass to interoperate and to use a common standard. It's so much easier to do it your way and try to take over. But the open network allows for the existing institutions to get more effective. Just as it's allowed existing scientists to use email and web systems and get more efficient. The open network allows the small matrix of companies to make an enormous amount of money. Just as I would argue the web allowed AOL to make an enormous amount of money before it tried to buy Time Warner. But it's one of the reasons why AOL had the money to buy Time Warner is they embraced the web, whereas their competition didn't. So the open network means committing to certain principles. Principles that don't just put the patient at the middle, but that put openness at the middle. Now, each of these choices is in its own way a monopoly in that it is a restriction of choice. Either we restrict our choice to enhancing the current system, we restrict our choice to a small set of companies, or we restrict our choice to common standards as a voluntary form of policy. And if we don't make one of these three choices, the government will eventually make it for us, because this is a heavily regulated market, as the previous speaker pointed out. So we heard Jamie yesterday talk about putting the patients in the middle of the network. And I fundamentally believe in that. Routing through the patient solves an enormous number of problems. But if we don't have standards, whether they're enforced by a small cartel or by an open system, the data that's coming in is going to overwhelm us. So this is from the Dust Bowl. And the Dust Bowl was an environmental disaster, but more than that, it was a policy disaster. Because our government encouraged people to rip up the grasslands and plant cotton during a very unusual period of rain. And when the natural system reasserted itself, all that cotton blew away and all the dust blew. And if we don't deal with the privacy problem that makes it difficult to standardize data in an open system, this is what's going to happen. Right? We're the houses, unfortunately. And so our policy choices can be enforced by that small group of companies. And if you've ever looked at Zynga's stock price or the stock price of companies that have built Twitter clients, you know that building on APIs to close data on the back end isn't necessarily the best system to deal with these things. Or we can build an open system. But if we're going to do that from a privacy perspective, we have to have a standards-based approach to informed consent. So this is the project I've been working on under the funding of the Kauffman Foundation for the last year. And it's a standardized way to provide an, a generic form of informed consent that you can take with you, that can go from project to project, that can travel with you and your data. And this is important enough that I actually have, have cut my Kaufman time in half and spent the rest of my half time joining SAGE as the chief commons officer. Because if we're going to actually do this, we have to implement some of these standards in clinical practice now. And so we're running a full generic study that lets anyone donate their genotype, just like I showed you, their phenotype, their lifestyle data, their clinical study data, as well as implementing this on five separate studies run, ranging from Parkinson's to Fanconi anemia to diabetes to melanoma and to breast cancer. And so there's these three key principles, which are honesty, portability, and reusability. We've got to be honest with people about their data and the choices they're making. We have to make sure that data is portable, and we have to make sure that data is reusable. 
because then we can actually start to change clinical outcomes with what we're doing. And the final point that I'll make is that it's very easy to think about the benefits of the matrix of closed companies, because that gets us there really quickly. But if we trade away our rights to get the economies of scale in the digital system, the way that we've done that in the analog system, we will have missed an enormous opportunity to make that leap from the homebrew hacker club to the computer industry, from the early internet to the web. And what we're going to be looking at is more like the late 1980s ISP market. And that would be a real shame. Thank you.